Welcome everyone. And thank you for joining the Children's Hospital Colorado Genetics Virtual Education Series. Today's topic is advances in genetic testing, new tools for diagnosis. Our virtual education sessions are designed to be interactive. We strongly encourage audience participation and all questions are welcome. So please note any questions or comments that you have for our presenter and we will be happy to respond during Q&A. Right now, everyone's microphones and cameras are muted. At the end of the presentation, we will unmute microphones and begin taking questions from our audience. Participants are also welcome to submit questions via our group chat feature. A handout to include instructions on how to access group chat and submit questions was sent to all registered participants. Please allow me to now introduce our speaker for today's session. Dr. Austin Larson, Assistant Professor, Section of Genetics and Metabolism with Children's Hospital Colorado. Thank you all for joining us today. Now let's begin. So thank you all for being on the webinar today. I'm really excited to be here and to be talking with you. This is the first of a, a year of uh, genetic topics that will be presented um, in, this, uh, in this venue. And so I'm going to start the year by uh, sort of having a very high level <clears throat> um, sort of philosophical discussion of the changes in genetic testing and how that impacts our job as geneticists and how that impacts the settings in which you might obtain genetic testing for your patients. So uh, in terms of financial disclosures, I have received compensation for giving similar lectures to this uh, from uh, Illumina, which is a genetic testing company, as well as Medscape, which is a genetic education company. I also participate in industry-sponsored clinical trials, and uh, that topic will not be discussed today. So by way of an introduction, I want to tell you about a family whose story really um, drives home for me just how different genetic testing is now as compared to even just six or seven years ago. So uh, this is um, a stock photo, but it's uh, representative of a patient who we met uh, recently, myself and my colleagues uh, last spring. And we initially became uh, acquainted with the patient and the family um, when uh, his mother was pregnant. So. Um, we were consulted as a, uh, as a group because uh, this child had had an older sibling that had died about eight years previously. And the, the older sibling had been uh, an apparently healthy newborn and had done fairly well in the first month or two of life, but um, started to have some abnormal movements and some poor feeding um, when he was about two months old. Um, that became concerning for the onset of seizures and epilepsy at that time, um, and a diagnostic evaluation was initiated. The diagnostic evaluation was very appropriate for the time. Again, this was, this was eight years ago and um, started with uh, some genetic testing as well as some biochemical testing. And the most prominent finding for the patient was that he had an elevation of a metabolite called homocysteine. So um, that was the, the main uh, thing that was being evaluated towards the end of his diagnostic evaluation. And unfortunately, that child died of progressive seizures at about four months of age. Um, the genetic testing at the time was not advanced enough to uh, be able to identify the cause of this patient's seizures. But a couple years later, the family uh, was given an opportunity for both parents and a, uh, a healthy sister to undergo a, a test called whole exome sequencing, which we will talk about in a minute. And um, based on that test, they found that each parent was a carrier for a condition that could potentially cause elevated homocysteine and seizures. So this was actually published as a um, as a potentially new cause of, uh, of seizures and elevated homocysteine, uh, the fact that both parents were carriers for different conditions. So that was the diagnosis that the family carried forward for the next eight years, and they had a couple of subsequent pregnancies. Um, those children were tested and were not found to be carriers for either of the two conditions that the parents were carriers for. And so that 
brings us to the point where we met this family because with this most recent pregnancy, uh, the family had been, uh, or the pregnancy had been tested by amniocentesis, and it was found that the uh, that the fetus uh, had both mutations in both genes. So, um, as part of our consultation, we um, expressed that we we did not feel that the uh, older patient had been accurately diagnosed, and and we felt like uh, we still did not have a specific diagnosis for this child. But we did feel that the risk was high enough that we wanted to deliver the child here at Children's Hospital, um, which we do in select cases when there is a prenatal genetic diagnosis or a prenatally identified um, anomaly that will require immediate pediatric subspecialty care. So this child was born here at Children's Hospital, and uh, we knew that the one clear um, metabolite uh, that was a biomarker of disease for the older child was that elevated homocysteine. So we got that a couple hours after birth, and unfortunately, we found that the younger child did have an elevated homocysteine. So we knew that he would be uh, similarly affected to the older child. And um, we did start some therapies at that point, <clears throat> uh, what we would call empiric therapies for the elevated homocysteine, some uh, supplements and medications that are uh, possibly helpful in that scenario. But the other thing that we had available to us last year that we that was not available uh, when the older sibling was born was something called rapid whole genome sequencing. Um, so uh, I'll talk a lot about rapid whole genome sequencing as sort of the, <clears throat> the final step in the evolution of genetic testing that brings together a lot of the trends that we've seen uh, in genetic testing over the past several years, and as the test that really, uh, more than any, has kind of started to change our practice. So um, this, uh, this younger child, um, our patient, uh, underwent rapid whole genome sequencing uh, when he was one day old, and when he was three days old, we had a definitive diagnosis for him. So um, we identified a, a condition called methionine synthase deficiency um, that does have specific treatment associated with it, that does dramatically change the course of the disease. So this child is now nine months old and has normal neurologic development and no seizures, uh, which is a, a um, markedly different course from his older sibling. Now, this is not a, an entirely apples to apples comparison because um, we did have the family history when we were evaluating the younger sibling. But I, I like to think and I would hope that if we were responsible for the initial diagnostic evaluation for the older sibling, we would have arrived at this diagnosis in time to start effective therapy and to significantly change his course. So um, I'm gonna start with uh, some vocabulary and this vocabulary will kind of double as a timeline of the changes in genetic testing over the past um, years and decades. And um, so I'll, I'll start with a couple of things that uh, probably all of you are, are pretty familiar with. So the first test to mention is something called chromosomal microarray. Um, that's been in pretty wide use since about 2007. And that's a test that allows us to look at the entire genome uh, in an untargeted way. So that's a what I would call an untargeted or a hypothesis-free test. Um, but uh, the downside of that test, despite being very broad, is that it's low resolution. So it can um, tell us whether genes are present or absent, but it can't tell us whether there are any spelling changes within the genes. That chromosomal microarray was the evolution of an earlier test called a karyotype or a chromosome analysis, which has been available for decades. And the, the chromosome analysis is, is not a molecular genetic technique. It's actually just a, a microscopic technique where um, a, a specially trained technician will look under the microscope at treated cells and actually visually assess the structure of the chromosomes. Like chromosomal microarray, that's an untargeted test. It doesn't have a specific hypothesis associated with it. It looks for any chromosomal anomaly. However, it's extremely low resolution. So uh, it's only the largest chromosomal changes that are visible uh, using that technique. At the other end of the spectrum, there's um, testing that's been available for a couple decades now called single gene testing, uh, in which we do have a hypothesis. We 
as clinicians feel like we have identified a specific suspicion of a particular condition and we send testing for that particular condition at very high resolution. So um, as opposed to the chromosomal microarray and the karyotype, it's a very high resolution test. We can identify um, single letter abnormalities within genes, but it's also a very narrow test. So we are only evaluating that one gene that we have a clinical suspicion for. Um, from single gene testing, um, there was an evolution to panel testing. So if there were two or three or 10 or 20 genes that could all cause a similar clinical presentation, um, we as clinicians might say, um, we want to test all of those genes. And, and that was uh, a feasible thing to do. It's, uh, it's sort of a middle ground. So it does involve a clinical hypothesis. It's not a hypothesis-free test. Um, but it is a little bit broader than that single gene test. The further evolution of uh, panel testing was to whole exome sequencing. <clears throat> and that's something that's been available to us since about 2012 or 2013, although it really wasn't widely available until the last few years. And um, the exome sequencing is really a panel that uh, includes all of the coding regions of all of the genes. And by doing that, we really are getting close to that hypothesis-free test or that totally untargeted test where regardless of the clinical scenario, we are just asking the lab to tell us about rare genetic variation that they see and to then allow us to, as clinicians, follow up on the, that rare genetic variation to convey to the family whether that's a diagnostic finding or not. Um, the final evolution, kind of bringing us to the most up-to-date technology that we have available today is whole genome sequencing. And whole genome sequencing really combines the best aspects of a number of the previous tests that I've mentioned. So it is a hypothesis-free test. It assesses the, um, all of the genetic material, not just the coding regions of the genes, not just genes that are associated with a particular phenotype, but all the genes. It also has the ability to get us the same information as the chromosomal microarray. So it can tell us if genes are present or absent. It can tell us if there are chromosomal rearrangements. Um, and so it really um, replaces all of the other testing that I mentioned in select clinical scenarios. This is also a little bit counterintuitive, but it's actually the fastest test in, um, in the hands of, of certain laboratories. It's the fastest test that we have available to us. And um, the reason for that paradox is that if we're not trying to select out any specific genetic material, but we just um, are sequencing all of it right off the bat, then that saves a couple days of, of time in the laboratory. Um, and it's also, um, I would say, often faster in the sense of preventing us from uh, needing to do multiple steps in an evaluation. So um, in the past, we had often done diagnostic evaluations where each test was contingent on the results of the test prior to that. And that could lead to this phenomenon called the diagnostic odyssey that a lot of folks are familiar with, whereby families um, are spending months or years or sometimes decades in search of a specific uh, diagnosis. So the, um, the technological advances that have allowed us to get to the point where we can use whole genome sequencing clinically are um, best exemplified by this chart that you can see. <clears throat> and this is a chart that's published every year by the National Institutes of Health. And the blue line on this chart represents something called Moore's Law. So <clears throat> Gordon Moore was the, the CEO of the microchip company Intel. And he said that um, every, I believe every two years, the uh, cost of computer processors would drop and their speed would double. So that led to this exponential improvement in computers, uh, whereby a uh, solar-powered pocket calculator has more computing power than the entire Apollo 11 space mission. So uh, that uh, exponential improvement over the course of decades leads to really dramatic changes. And <clears throat> what you can see is that the green line, the cost of whole genome sequencing, has not just uh, dropped exponentially, but has uh, dropped far faster than that even exponential improvement in computing power. 
And so um, starting in the last few years, we've gotten to the point where the cost is low enough that this really is a, a viable clinical test and a test that can start to be used in a wider variety of clinical scenarios. I will point out that the cost that's represented here is just the raw cost of sequencing. So that's not the cost of a clinical test, which would include the analysis and the, uh, the clinical report, which is still more expensive than what's represented here. So in addition to the breadth of testing, we've also gotten to the point where this testing is faster and faster. So there is now a Guinness World Record for fastest whole genome genetic diagnosis. So that was 19 hours. There was a, a baby in San Diego who was suspected of having a genetic condition. They did a blood draw for that baby, brought it over to the lab that is associated with the hospital there. Uh, the lab ran her whole genome sequence and had a uh, definitive genetic diagnosis for her 19 hours after her blood was drawn. Um, that is a little bit reliant on um, having the lab <coughs> uh, co-localized with the hospital. Um, but we here at Children's Hospital Colorado, uh, working with the same lab at, at UC San Diego, have um, had turnaround on the order of 48 hours for uh, results of whole genome testing. So um, the parable of the lamppost, I believe, is a, a really apt way to conceptualize the changes in genetic testing and what that means for diagnosis. So um, for those of you who don't know the parable of the lamppost, it's a, a story of how um, you and your uh, friend or, or partner are out at dinner, have a nice meal, and then you walk out of the restaurant. Um, there's a street light right out inside of the, outside of the restaurant, and you see that there's a, a guy on his hands and knees going around the street light. Um, he looks like he needs help, so you, you ask, um, you know, can we help you with anything? Uh, and he says, yeah, I lost my keys. I can't unlock my car. I can't get home. And say, oh, well, where, where did you lose your keys? Uh, he says, I, I lost them across the street. He said, well, why aren't you looking across the street? And he says, well, this is where the light is. Um, so um, that is, I think, representative of the change in the approach um, in genetic testing. In the past, we've only had the ability to look where the light is, um, and that has uh, led us to, um, to have a relatively low diagnostic yield in a lot of scenarios, as opposed to um, our current testing, which is become, becoming broader and broader, less and less hypothesis-driven, um, and is allowing us to look outside of where, where the light is and um, where the actual diagnosis may be and not just being limited by the technology that's available to us. So I want to tell you about uh, two patients that I care for that um, in different ways represent this idea of not just looking where the light is. So um, this is a picture of my patient. Uh, her name is Lydia, and her parents have given me uh, permission to, to use her picture and talk about her story uh, in lectures like this because they, they do feel really strongly about the, the power of um, whole genome sequencing. So uh, Lydia is a patient that I met when she was about six weeks old. Um, she uh, was born and was, was relatively healthy after birth, although the doctors that initially cared for her noted that she had a hypopigmentation of her hair and skin uh, and her irises. So um, there was initial concern for albinism, which is not an immediate uh, medical concern. But over the next couple weeks, uh, it became clear that Lydia was not gaining weight. And um, she was admitted to the hospital at about six weeks of age. In addition to the fact that she was not gaining weight and she had hypopigmentation, it was also noted that she had a very large liver. So Lydia was initially admitted for almost three months while we tried to figure out what her diagnosis was and how to treat it. And this was about five years ago. So at that time, we didn't have um, immediate access to uh, whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing. And her evaluation um, proceeded um, through multiple steps or, or tiers of testing. There were initially some blood tests um, that moved on to biopsies of, of several organs uh, of her intestines and of her liver. And um, that was our first big clue was that we saw evidence of lysosomal storage. So we knew that, that Lydia had a lysosomal storage disorder. 
And then from there, we were able to get a panel test that covered all of the lysosomal storage disorders, as well as looking at all of those enzymes. And unfortunately, um, that that test struck out. So that was a couple months of, of waiting for a result, and we did not um, we didn't find anything. Um, so Lydia was eventually discharged from the hospital on TPN. So you can see in this picture that she has a surgical line called a Broviac, and that was the way that she got nutrition because she was just not able to gain weight um, when feeding enterally due to intestinal failure. And so uh, eventually we were able to get approval for whole exome sequencing, and the turnaround time for whole exome sequencing when we sent it was six months. So um, for this, this young baby who's um, quite ill, um, we, were, we were waiting six months for, uh, for an answer from her whole exome sequencing. But when the whole exome sequencing came back, um, it did give us a, a very strong clue, which was a de novo mutation, meaning a, a mutation not inherited from her parents in a gene called CLCN7. Now that gene was not known to be associated with lysosomal storage disorders. It was associated with a skeletal condition. However, uh, there were some characteristics of this change in the CLCN7 gene that made it very compelling as a diagnostic finding. Um, I contacted some folks at the National Institutes of Health who are uh, experts in lysosomal storage disorders, and they were able to evaluate Lydia's cells. They were also able to make a mouse model of her condition and demonstrate that this CLCN7 mutation was a diagnostic finding for her. So that had a couple of implications. It was important because we now knew that um, there was not a risk of recurrence for Lydia's family. It was also important because in the process of uh, proving that this was a diagnostic variant, the folks at the National Institutes of Health were able to demonstrate that a couple of uh, available medications uh, that, were, that could be prescribed for other indications also improved the behavior of her lysosomes in, uh, in cell culture. So it led to a, a potential therapy for her as well. Now, I think that this story is really important in terms of the idea of looking where the light is because um, lysosomal storage disorders are a pretty well characterized group of conditions. And I think most people would say that if you have clear evidence of a lysosomal storage disorder, that you should be able to make a genetic diagnosis um, with targeted testing. And yet we weren't able to do that in her case, but by doing untargeted testing, we actually identified a disease that was not even known to exist, which is, um, I think, really uh, an important point about the, the power of untargeted testing. I want to tell you a, a second story about uh, untargeted testing or, or um, not just looking where the light is. And this is a, about a patient named Mila. Um, her story has um, had a lot of publicity lately. Um, and was recently published in, uh, in the New York Times, which you can see that article on the left, and the New England Journal of Medicine in the more technical form on the right. So um, Mila was a patient who uh, was completely healthy for the first three years of her life. And then around age three, she started to just get a little bit clumsy. She had some, some changes in her, um, in her gait. She was tripping a little bit. Um, she was otherwise doing fine in school, but over the course of the next three years, it was clear that she had progressive neurologic symptoms. So she was getting more and more clumsy, and then towards the end of that time period, uh, she was having a harder, harder and harder time in school and, and wasn't learning very well. And then eventually she started to lose her vision. So um, that was when we met her in the hospital. She was admitted for a diagnostic evaluation related to her loss of vision and her progressive neurologic symptoms. Um, Mila had a, a brain MRI. She also had some biopsies done that um, were suggestive of a condition called neuronal ceroid lipofuscinosis, or Batten disease. So um, because we had a pretty clear idea of the, the condition that she had, we again sent a, a panel test related to the, the genes that can cause that diagnosis. And um, we did not find a definitive diagnosis on that test, but we did find that Mila had one genetic change in a gene in which two changes would be necessary to cause the disease. So we were left at a point with a, a child with progressive symptoms that um, did not yet have a definitive genetic diagnosis, although we had a pretty good clue of, um, of what the possible diagnosis was. So 
Mila's mother took it upon herself to find a research study that she could enroll Mila in and get whole genome sequencing. And with that whole genome sequencing, the researchers were able to, to not just look where the light is in terms of the coding region of these genes, but to also look at the regions um, called the intronic regions inside that gene that don't actually make up the coding protein, but they're responsible for how the coding regions are arranged or spliced. And that intronic variant caused a splicing abnormality that was the second diagnostic mutation for Mila. Now, um, the researchers that she had gotten involved with from a diagnostic perspective had the idea to um, use a technology called antisense oligonucleotides to block that splicing mutation and restore normal splicing for her cells. They were able in less than a year to go from that hypothesis to actually developing a drug with FDA approval that was given to Mila and it still is being given to Mila that we feel has slowed the course of her disease. Um, Mila's mother, I know, feels very strongly about um, her, uh, her story being shared and also feels very strongly about um, patients getting a genetic diagnosis earlier in their course when they have more potential for treatment. So um, had Mila had whole genome sequencing when she first started having symptoms at age three um, and had this drug been able to be developed earlier in the course, um, she may have, uh, we may have been able to avoid some of the progressive symptoms that she's had. So I've talked a lot about um, targeted versus untargeted testing. Um, I want to make it clear that um, this is not a binary scenario. This is really a spectrum. So we go from more targeted to less targeted testing. On one end of the spectrum, we might be just testing a single letter within the genome for a known familial variant. And on the other end of the spectrum, we may be doing whole genome sequencing. You can also think of targeted testing as being the population to which it's applied. So um, the broader that the indications are for genetic testing, the more untargeted its application is. Um, and I, I think it's really important at this point, I've talked a lot about the power of untargeted testing in showing us things that we never thought to look for. Um, but it's also important to be cautious and to remember that when you're sending an untargeted test, you have to interpret it in a different way than, you're, than when you're sending a targeted test. So just to give you a couple more examples, um, newborn screening is an untargeted test in a couple ways. So um, the newborn screen is applied to uh, the entire population. Um, it's also a somewhat untargeted test in terms of the number of conditions that are tested for. So uh, decades ago, newborn screening was only looking for one condition, phenylketonuria, and then over time it's expanded and is continuing to expand to uh, test for a wider and wider variety of conditions. And so as the number of conditions have expanded and as we're applying this to the entire population, we, uh, those of us that um, follow up on newborn screen results are well aware of the fact that untargeted tests can often give us false positives and that we need to be very careful about the way that we interpret those results and the way that we convey them to families. Uh, karyotyping is an untargeted test. So um, probably everyone on this call is familiar with uh, getting chromosome analysis and it's something that's been part of medicine for decades. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a test that sometimes can give um, unwanted or uh, uncertain results. Um, but that's something that we've dealt with, and um, the, uh, the evolution to, to microarray and then to exome and genome sequencing, it's not a, a change in category in terms of type of testing that we're doing. It's, um, it really is a, um, an evolution of the same mindset that we've applied before. It's just a much better test with higher resolution. So um, this, is, uh, this is my technical interlude in this talk. And um, I, I do want to talk in some technical detail about how the approach needs to be different when we're sending untargeted testing. So this diagram is something called the Fagan's nomogram. So Fagan's nomogram was initially published in the 1970s and has been republished several times since. So I took this from a, a publication from 2011. And um, Fagan's nomogram is um, a, an easy way to apply uh, Bayesian reasoning to uh, clinical scenarios and test results. 
So on the left, we have a pretest probability. And in the, in the setting of genetic testing, the pretest probability is what the clinician brings to the case. So this is any clinical intuitions that we have, any physical exam findings, any initial radiology, um, radiology studies or biochemical studies that give us a, uh, a possibility of a, of a scenario, uh, a possibility of a, di um, a diagnosis. So that may be as broad as seizures or developmental delay, or it may be as, as specific as hyperhomocysteinemia. The likelihood ratio is um, the test result that we get. So if we send this broad test, and uh, we get a result back, the likelihood ratio tells us how much we should weight that information in terms of um, arriving at a potential diagnostic uh, result for the patient. And then the post-test probability that you see on the far right is, um, is what we convey to the family and, and to other providers about how certain we are of this diagnosis. So I'm gonna walk you to, through two scenarios here that um, demonstrate the ways in which pretest probability and likelihood ratio uh, influence how we interpret results. So um, the light blue line, the, the um, higher line on the nomogram is uh, Lydia's scenario. So Lydia was a patient who, um, um, despite having a suspicion of a lysosomal storage disorder, we didn't, she, she was not, um, characteristic of any particular lysosomal condition. So we had a, a relatively low pretest probability for any one condition. Then if you go to the likelihood ratio, we got a test result back. It was a de novo finding, um, meaning it was uh, brand new. It was not present in her parents. It had never been seen in the entire population. And we know from uh, doing this testing on a lot of folks that the average person only has one de novo finding. So this is a patient with lysosomal storage who has a de novo, an extremely rare um, de novo mutation in a lysosomal gene. I would ascribe to that a very high likelihood ratio. So at the end of that process of reasoning, I conveyed to her family that I felt that we had a very likely diagnosis or in this um, mock-up a 99% chance that we had found the diagnosis. Mila's scenario was a little bit different in terms of the results of her whole genome sequencing. So we did have a very high uh, likelihood of her having a specific condition. So um, I'm saying here that we, there was a 90% chance that she had Batten disease. So when they looked at her whole genome sequence, even though her genetic result was unusual, um, it had never been known to be a mechanism for this disease before, it was not in the coding region of the gene, it was intronic, um, so it didn't have as high of a likelihood ratio, but given how high our pretest probability was, we arrived at the same point of concluding that we had a definitive genetic diagnosis. And I think it's really important to go through this same thought process with any result that we get. And the more untargeted the test is that we send, the more important it is that we go through this thought process. There was a, a recent article in the Wall Street Journal, this was uh, published in May of 2019, about a family, this is a, a child with seizures and developmental delay. She also has some unique facial features. Um, I would say it's almost certain that she does have a genetic diagnosis to account for those features. Um, this is the story of, of the family who, over the course of several years, um, they were one of the first families to get chromosomal microarray testing. Um, and when there was an unusual chromosomal microarray result, that was conveyed to the family as a diagnostic finding. Uh, they became very invested in that diagnosis until a few years later, it was, uh, it was concluded that she did not uh, actually have that diagnosis or it was not a diagnostic finding. Then um, she was one of the first patients to undergo whole exome sequencing. Um, similarly, there was a, a rare finding in whole exome sequencing that was again conveyed to the family as a diagnostic result, and that was again then rescinded a few years later as our experience with whole exome sequencing increased. So I think it's really important with, per, for, with us as providers as we move into um, newer and newer generations of genetic testing that we be very cautious of the uncertainty that uh, surrounds those results and that we convey that uncertainty honestly and transparently with families so that families don't have the same experience as this family did. So 
um, I've basically conveyed to you a scenario where um, the right answer about which genetic test do you do uh, is becoming easier and easier. So um, as the testing gets broader and faster and cheaper, it's easier and easier to make the decision to get whole genome or whole exome sequencing to get a very broad test. So then what does that leave us to do as geneticists? So um, this, is, this is my conception of what my job is now that um, broad genetic testing is becoming the norm. So my, my first judgment call is how likely is uh, any genetic diagnosis at all? So um, there's not a right answer to when to do or not to do genetic testing. It really depends on the resources in your specific location. but. I feel that I can relatively accurately um, separate patients into some buckets, like say a 10% likelihood of a genetic diagnosis or a 50% or an 80% likelihood of a genetic diagnosis. And that likelihood also um, uh, conveys uh, when those resources should be, should be used. Um, and that's a, moving, uh, that's a moving target. So over time, as the test gets cheaper and more available, um, you can kind of relax your standards as to how likely a genetic diagnosis needs to be in order to use that test. Another question that I ask myself, and it's, it's pretty rare, but occasionally I can make a specific diagnosis with high confidence just based on the clinical scenario. So uh, to, get, to give you a sense of how rare this is, I um, send genetic testing uh, several hundred times a year, so maybe 300 times a year. Um, and when I, when I looked back, I had sent a targeted test just to confirm a clinical diagnosis and not uh, as a broad test, I had done that six times. So maybe 2% of the time I'm able to, um, to arrive at a, a, a specific diagnosis with high confidence. And there's some ascertainment bias there because I, here at Children's Hospital, I really only see uh, very rare conditions. Another question I ask myself is, can I influence that pretest probability in a way that will change the interpretation of the test, um, but will be a cost-effective and time-sensitive and non-invasive piece of information to get for that patient? So um, some examples of that are just specific physical exam maneuvers. So that's completely uh, cost-effective and time-sensitive and non-invasive. Uh, some other examples might be just initial blood tests, like a, a CBC or a comprehensive metabolic panel that might provide results that would really change the pretest probability and therefore change the interpretation of any genetic results that we get. Um, another example might be um, doing a, a, an x-ray of the skeleton to look for specific skeletal findings. Another question that I always ask myself is how high is my suspicion for a mosaic, an epigenetic, or a repeat mediated disease? Um, I haven't gone into technical details on this, but these are categories of disease that are not well identified by whole genome sequencing. So these are things that are still not amenable to our broadest test. And that's changing over time, um, both in the setting of mosaic conditions, which are um, the labs are doing a better and better job at identifying those conditions. Um, and also repeat-mediated diseases. The labs are doing better and better at uh, being able to identify repeat-mediated diseases like um, myotonic dystrophy or fragile X or uh, Huntington's disease. Another question I ask myself in terms of which genetic test to send is how time-sensitive is the diagnosis? And um, this is often a, an easy delineation here. It's just inpatient versus outpatient. So for an inpatient, I might be much more likely to, to use resources to get a very fast genetic test um, as opposed to an outpatient uh, evaluation where it would be less time sensitive. And then finally, when I have results, um, I, uh, I think it's very important to think about the clinical scenario we're in and how certain we need to be about the specific diagnosis. And that really relies on what, um, uh, what intervention will be implemented if that diagnosis is present. So an example of that might be a bone marrow transplant. Um, I need to be more than 99% sure of a specific diagnosis to trigger the intervention of a bone marrow transplant. On the other hand, if the, if the intervention is to um, provide additional developmental therapies in school, like uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy, um, I might convey something that I'm 80% sure of as a likely or a probable diagnosis and um, to justify those interventions. Um, but uh, I'm not certain enough of it to trigger something like a bone marrow transplant or a prescribed medication.
So there's also a hidden benefit of more sensitive genetic testing. And this is, this is something that really has not been part of genetics because genetic testing, honestly, in most scenarios has not been very good until recently. Um, and that's the fact that a negative test can actually have implications for a diagnostic evaluation and for management of a patient. So the more sensitive the test gets, that means the fewer false negatives that we have when we do testing, then the more meaningful a negative result is. So our negative predictive value improves over time as the test gets more sensitive. And I really do think that um, in a number of scenarios, we're getting to the point where we have a good enough negative predictive value that a negative genetic test can actually be a helpful piece of information and can change how we manage a patient. I think that um, there is potential uh, significant benefit for rural patients in particular with regards to untargeted genetic testing. So um, I see a lot of patients in Grand Junction and in Durango. I work with a lot of families who have been back and forth eight hour drives in the winter over multiple passes to see a specific subspecialist in Denver and drive back to Durango and, and do it again um, as these families work through um, five or eight or a dozen different subspecialists trying to find a specific diagnosis. And um, the availability of broad genetic testing can actually take the place of a lot of those subspecialist evaluations, not in terms of management strategies, but in terms of the diagnostic evaluation. And um, if we can implement that early in the diagnostic process, we can make sure that those uh, expensive and um, uh, time-consuming trips that families have from rural areas to make sure that those are as valuable as possible and that those folks are seeing the right specialists that they need for management and not um, not just seeing a bunch of, of different clinics for different diagnostic tests. So um, the question then is what is the future of genetics and I, I um, talked about that a little bit in terms of walking you through the judgment calls that I, I feel like I'm making now that uh, broad genetic testing is becoming the norm. But I think you can take that one step further and sort of imagine a scenario where um, genetic testing and geneticists have, have more of the role of, of radiology in the hospital. And what I mean by that is that um, the, the genetic testing has the potential to be more and more of a, an infrastructure and less and less of a, a niche subspecialty. So um, in the case of radiology, this, this is a stock photo of a radiologist looking at a brain MRI. That brain MRI uh, in all of its detail lives in the electronic medical record. And anytime that patient comes for care, any provider that's seeing that patient has the ability to go back to that raw data to actually look at the images of the brain MRI and evaluate them in the setting of new symptoms. So, Maybe this brain MRI was initially done for a headache, um, but over time, this patient now has growth failure, and you're specifically interested in the pituitary gland in a way that you weren't when you initially got that test. If that raw data is present in the electronic medical record, it has continued value over time as this patient is evolving in terms of their clinical circumstances. So um, I really appreciate you listening to my talk today as, as I walked you through some of, the, um, some of the changes that have happened in genetic testing as it's gotten uh, broader and broader, faster and faster, more broadly applicable, less hypothesis driven. And uh, my goal today was to, to sort of talk to you about how that changes the mindset of how to interpret test results and when testing is appropriate. Um, so I'd be happy to have any, uh, any discussions that you all want to have about the, the implications of technological advances in genetic testing. I know that um, in terms of the folks that, um, that registered, there was a, a question specifically about mitochondrial disease. So I'd be happy to, to address that if, uh, if that person's on the call and wanted to, to expand on that. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's open it up now, and we can talk about any cases or um, any questions that you all have. Hey, I'm showing that we do have a few people who joined our session today. Um, we have Stefan on the line. Um, it looks like Ashley, Justin, and Diana. Do any of you have questions for Dr. Larson today? I have unmuted your microphones. Stefan, any questions for us today? 
How about you, Diana? Do you have any questions for Dr. Austin Larson today? No, thank you. Thank you. Justin, do you have any questions for us? Questions. Alrighty, everyone. Well, we're going to go ahead and just wrap up our session a little early today if we don't have any questions or comments from our audience. Um, I did just have a couple of items that I wanted to share with everyone um, as we close the session today. Um, first of all, I would like to thank our presenter, Dr. Larson, for sharing his expertise and to also thank our participants for joining today. Um, an evaluation survey regarding today's session is going to be emailed to all participants today. So if you could please take about five minutes of your time and share your feedback on how we can improve future sessions, as well as any suggested future topics that you may have um, for our presenters, we would greatly appreciate that information from you and that feedback. Um, today was actually part one of a two-part series um, that we will be having in February. So those of you who were able to join today, we do encourage you to join um, our February 11th virtual education session. And that topic will be around genetic diagnosis for children with developmental delay. So please keep a lookout for a flyer for that session, which will be distributed within the next couple of days. So please be sure to sign up. It's a very exciting session um, in conjunction with today. So we definitely want you all to participate in that as well. So again, I'd like to thank everyone for sharing your lunch hour with us. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you next month.